to refresh your memory from several weeks ago when we last considered this servant of God named Epaphroditus, allow me to reconstruct my take on the scenario that is related to the Apostle Paul to Timothy and Epaphroditus in the city of Rome. The Philippian church, which was the first church founded by the Apostle Paul in what we would now call Europe, had always had a wonderful love affair with the Apostle Paul. They loved him beyond description and he loved them more obviously than any other of the congregations that he had planted. A demonstration of their love for Paul and the Savior that Paul served was their continual involvement in his ministry by prayer and financial support whenever they had the means to do so despite their their deep poverty. Apparently the Philippian church members were able by some means or another to send a wonderful Christian named Epaphroditus to Rome not only to take money to Paul so he could pay his own way for food and raiment, but also so he could defray some of the expenses while he was in Rome in getting the gospel out. It is amazing that some people recognize that it takes money to make everything else in the world available to people, but they seem oblivious to the fact that it also takes money to spread the gospel. The Philippians were not so oblivious Praise the Lord. At any rate, it was also the design of Epaphroditus and the Philippian church for him to remain in Rome and help Paul in whatever way he could, both to tending to his personal needs, his personal physical needs, as well as aiding in the work of the ministry there in Rome. And this would enable Paul, they hoped, to send Timothy to help them tend to some spiritual problems he seemed particularly suited to dealing with that they were facing and they felt they needed his help resolving. However, something went wrong with their good intentions. Things frequently go wrong with good intentions, don't they? Probably traveling with several other men from Philippi, Epaphroditus took sick and he almost died. Having to return to Philippi, the traveling companions then left the dreadfully ill Epaphroditus in Rome with Paul and went on their way. In addition to Epaphroditus being in no physical condition to help Paul out, it turned out that Paul's trial before Caesar was on the docket and Timothy, who was as familiar with Paul's case as anyone in the world, and who had no doubt done a great deal of footwork for Paul simply could not be spared at that time to travel all the way back to Philippi. Therefore Paul had no choice but to send uh, Epaphroditus back to Philippi um, instead, of, instead of sending Timothy to them. Thus by solving the problem of getting Epaphroditus off his back and returning him to Philippi and retaining the services of Timothy for the impending appeal to Caesar, Paul had solved his most immediate problem. However, as every experienced leader and problem solver must come to understand quickly or be doomed to repeated failures, what new problem had Paul created by solving the problem of keeping Timothy in Rome to help him with his trial? Every time you devise a solution to a problem, if you are a problem solver, if you are a leader, if you are a decision maker, you must always ask yourself the question, with this solution to this problem, what new problems am I creating by implementing this solution? Because every problem solved creates new problems to solve, I guarantee it. And some people would say, Amen. Apparently, Paul anticipated that by sending Epaphroditus back to Philippi, he might have been creating two problems by solving the one problem, one problem he creates is for Epaphroditus and one for the church people in Philippi. 
Our text shows us how the Apostle Paul sought to solve two problems that he anticipated being created by addressing his most immediate and more important problem of preparing for his appeal to Caesar. So if you would turn in Philippians to chapter 2 and verse 25, once you find that, please stand with me for the reading of God's word. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 25 we will read together, you reading silently while I read aloud through verse 30. And as we read this passage, I want you to notice how Paul solves Epaphroditus' potential problem in verses 25, 26, and 27, and how he solves the Philippians' potential problem in verses 28, 29, and 30. Beginning with verse 25, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger that, and, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again you may rejoice and that I may have and that I may be the less sorrowful receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me won't you please be seated we trust God once again blesses the reading and hearing of his word. Sending Epaphroditus back to Philippi could have created the appearance of failure on his part. However, Epaphroditus was guilty of no failure. He had performed admirably. To convince Epaphroditus that he had not failed, Paul wrote verses 25, 26, and 27 explaining the return of Epaphroditus from Epaphroditus' point of view. We've already carefully examined those verses several weeks ago. But what about the Philippians? They were experiencing some degree of difficulty that promised to elevate the level of strife and disunity if not dealt with properly. They sent Epaphroditus to Rome so they could get Timothy. How do they respond now when Epaphroditus comes back? Now they love and cherish him, but had they thought he was the man to solve their problem, they would not have sent him to Rome so that they could get Timothy. Was Epaphroditus not good enough to stay with Paul? Some might have wondered that. Was there something wrong with him? Others might have wondered that. Such questions could have haunted Epaphroditus had not Paul written verses 28, 29, and 30, which explains the man's return considering the Philippian perspective. Stay with me now as we see how the Apostle Paul goes about showing the Philippians that their mission of sending Epaphroditus actually accomplished more than they had intended, even though it did not turn out the way they had originally designed. Three considerations for the Philippians, and for you and me, by the way, to ponder when evaluating the success of any spiritual venture that seems to go sour. Okay? First, Paul's motives are described. In verse 28, Paul shows the Philippians what his desire was regarding them. Did those people love Paul? Well, of course they did. We know that. That being the case, the reasons why he was doing what he did was very, very important to them. Paul writes, I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. First, Paul states for their benefit his motives toward them. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again you may rejoice. 
The word carefully translate a word, translates a word that refers to doing something with haste, to doing something expeditiously, to doing something diligently. In other words, Paul wasted no time at all in sending Epaphroditus back to Philippi. Just as soon as the man was able to travel, he was sent on his way along with this letter to the Philippian church that we are now studying. The haste with which Paul sent Epaphroditus, therefore, needs to be carefully explained. They might have thought, was Paul eager to get rid of Epaphroditus? Well, the answer, of course, was yes. Yes, he was eager to get rid of the man. The question is, why was he so eager to get rid of him? There are several likely reasons. For one, he did not want to spend valuable time during his trial taking care of a sick man. Does that sound so unreasonable? Does it sound unreasonable to you? Had a guy show up at my office one time years ago, and I mean, I tell you what, I was furiously studying. When, when you see me at my study doing this, don't even bother to ask if I'm busy. I'm obviously busy. Right? Right? Hello? When I'm... I'm busy. Guy walked into my office, stood at the front door, knocked on the door. He said, are you busy, Pastor? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I am. He said, you are? Well, yes. What do you think I do? Play video games? I've never played a video game in my life, and I don't play video games while I'm at the office. So I, I, think, there are, I, think, I think it's reasonable that the Apostle Paul, because he was terrifically busy, would not want to be burdened with this man who is sick. Remember, Paul is fighting for his life here. But that's of no direct concern to the Philippians. His honest motive regarding them was actually their rejoicing. Remember, the last they had heard about Epaphroditus was that he was at death's door. The guys that accompanied him but then decided to go ahead and go back to Philippians. Oh, this is your problem, Paul. Bye and see you later. They go, oh, yeah, by the way, Epaphroditus is really sick. He may not live. What? Yeah, but we got to get back to go to work. You know, I mean, you know, it's not like you expect us to stay. Oh, oh. So the Philippians, how they must have ached, how they must have sorrowed because they had no news. They were wondering what's going on with this man they loved. And, and why were they so sorrowful? Because loving Paul as they did, they sent to Paul the best man they had, the most beloved man they had, the most dedicated man they had. So naturally, they would grieve over the possibility of Epaphroditus dying or being close to death. Paul, being as compassionate and tender of heart as he was, would have taken that, of course, personally very, very hard. A man who had suffered as much as he had had no desire to see others suffering by, if he could possibly prevent it, um, and he could prevent their needless suffering by sending Epaphroditus back, and so he did, and he did so as quickly as he possibly could. Second, Paul states for their benefit his motive for himself. First, his motive for them. This is the reason for your benefit why I sent him back. Now let me state to you uh, my reason for my benefit for sending him back, and that I may be the less sorrowful. I already touched on this a bit, but let me get specific. Paul sent Epaphroditus back because in sending him back, it relieved Paul of a great emotional burden. Understand that there is nothing wrong with lightening your own load emotionally if the cause of Christ is helped thereby, and the cause of Christ was helped thereby, and this is exactly what Paul's decision did for him. With Epaphroditus back in Philippi, Paul would not be distracted from his trial. Paul would not be responsible for the welfare of Epaphroditus. And Paul would not have to worry about the Philippians worrying. It's a win, win, win scenario with Paul's solution to the problem. Next, the Philippians' manner is prescribed. Have you ever been in a situation that was totally unexpected and you didn't know how to act? 
And one of the ways that you know you've been in that kind of situation is you think to yourself, if that ever happens again, I'll do, I'll do this. And of course, it never happens again that way. So you learned a potential lesson, okay? You ever been dumbfounded? I've been dumbfounded. I, I remember one time I'm conducting the, the, the funeral service for Carl Nikola, World War II uh, veteran, served in the European Theater of Operations. And when Carl Nikola uh, was promoted to glory, uh, the, the undertaker was able to put him in his discharge uniform. Uh, could you wear your uniform today, Jim? I couldn't wear my uniform today. Let's see, anybody around? Carlos! Uh, I don't even know anybody. Uh, uh, most, got, most of us who served in the military could not wear the uniform that we were discharged in, okay? But Carl Nicola was in his uniform and his, uh, the service, the ceremony was, uh, took place at Riverside National Cemetery. And I remember I'm standing, I'm standing at the head of the casket and his only son is standing at the other end of the casket and, and as I am attempting to wax eloquent and be a blessing to the family and extol the virtues of this veteran, Gary's phone rings. So what does Gary do? He answers it. And what does he say? Oh, I'm at my dad's funeral. Yeah, it's going on right now. So what's going on? He conducts a conversation, standing up there with me next to the casket. I was utterly dumbfounded, completely at a loss for words. I did not know what to say. I was livid. I was filled with rage and contempt. I didn't know what to say. Well, uh, sometimes we find ourselves in situations that are so surprising, that are so astonishing, that you are completely dumbfounded. And I suspect Paul might have anticipated that kind of reaction from the Philippians if Epaphroditus shows up, I'm here, and they wouldn't know what to say, they wouldn't know what to think, they wouldn't know what to do, their question would be, how do we treat Epaphroditus? Is he a returning hero or is he returning as a failure? Is the best man that we had not good enough for the Apostle Paul? How do we act toward this fellow? In case the Philippians did not know, Paul tells them, act this way. Act this way. First, act this way presently act this way immediately verse 29 begins receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness in other words open up your arms welcome him with a smile give him a kiss on both cheeks and give him a hug one of those back slapping back slapping uh, man hugs okay do that to it do that to him in other words treat this guy like a hero show him your absolute delight that he is alive and not dead that he is healthy and not sick any longer the imperative form of the verb shows paul is directing their appropriate conduct toward this man named epaphroditus he's not suggesting what they do he's directing what they do he is the spiritual doctor who has written them a prescription to be taken immediately and also act this way permanently and hold such in reputation. The word reputation translates Greek word that is usually translated into our English word honor. Hold him in honor. Paul is telling those folks then to act delighted and joyful when you greet him and make sure that you treat him with honor over time. In other words, do not give him a warm welcome today and then treat him with suspicion and aloofness tomorrow and all next week as you begin to wonder, why is he really here? How come he came back so soon? Is there something wrong with him? Epaphroditus, according to the Apostle Paul, should hereafter be treated with courtesy and with respect. And I ask you, would Paul prescribe such treatment for a man who'd failed? No. 
Epaphroditus, you see, did not fail. He, nothing, listen to this now. He did not fail when he could not complete his task. God's plan all along was for him to try and not to apparently succeed in the eyes of the pragmatists. The unsaved and the spiritually immature are blind to the reality that Christian victory is in the effort. It's in the striving to serve God. And that is a principle we would do well to apply to our own lives and her own ministries. Whether you, quote, succeed in the eyes of your fellow man is utterly irrelevant. There's only one thing required of the servant of God, that he be faithful. Amen? The results are up to God. Paul's description to them of Epaphroditus' ministry removes all doubt. Look at the effort described in verse 30. Epaphroditus strove to supply your lack of service toward me. This man's effort was to do for Paul what the Philippians themselves could not do for Paul. They sent him on their behalf to make up for their lack of service to Paul. And this is an example that we at Calvary Road Baptist Church have attempted, have sought to follow over the years as I will explain to some of you who are, who are curious to know, I'll be glad to explain in private some of the things that we have done over the years to do for those as Epaphroditus did for the Philippian church. Back to our text. Did Epaphroditus actually make up for the Philippians' lack of service? No. No, he didn't. They sent him there to make up for their lack of service. And so did he do that? No, no, no. He brought money from them, to be sure, but he was never able to stay and minister to Paul personally. However, does Paul bring attention to that? No, no. You see, for Paul, the commendation was for the effort. He did try. He did try. What then did Epaphroditus achieve in his apparently, in the eyes of some people, failed mission? Verse 30 begins, Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. Interesting. Some Christians are so concerned about their prestige, so concerned about their privilege, so concerned about their position, so concerned about all that kind of stuff that doesn't really matter. And surprisingly to some, Epaphroditus did achieve two things that Paul finds quite noteworthy. First, the man almost forfeited his life for the work of Christ. Paul does not criticize him for this, but rather commends him. It's almost as if Paul thinks that the work of Christ is more important than just about anything else. It's almost as if the Apostle Paul thinks that the work of Christ is the most important thing a man could possibly engage in, trumping everything else. Amen. More important than career. More important than college. More important than hobbies. Ooh. More important than a game. Ooh. However, that's not all. The man was also able, surely by God's grace, to set aside regard for his own life. Recognize Paul isn't so much bragging on the man almost dying in service to Christ as he is bragging on the man not regarding his own life. He doesn't believe that the most important thing is his life. The most important thing is the cause. It's the cause. I wonder for how long 
after a soldier dies, the flag will continue to be important to him. But I know that when the child of God dies for the cause of Christ, he will never, over the course of eternity, be sorry for sacrificing his life of Jesus Christ. I wonder about young men being used as cannon fodder to achieve political goals by no account politicians. I have a serious issue with that. I have absolutely no problem with a child of God forfeiting his life for the Savior who died for him on the cross. I believe, though sometimes it's questionable about the benefit of dying for one's country, there is no question about the benefit of sacrificing your life for the cause of Christ when it is called for. How amazingly Christ-like was this Epaphroditus. We send a man out to do a job. He comes back and the specific task we assigned him for some reason doesn't get done. We investigate and find out that during the course of the performance of his duties, the man displayed no obvious signs of foolishness or stupidity, but seems in all respects to have been selfless, to have been humble, to have been Christ-like. Still, for reasons of failing health or due to circumstances entirely beyond his control, his objective was not received or achieved. So guess what, people? The man succeeded. You say, well, he, he didn't accomplish his goal. He succeeded. He succeeded. He is to be received with joy and with gladness and he is to be honored upon his return. Why? Because he failed in the task assigned to him? No. Because in the overarching task assigned to each and every one of us, in that he succeeded. Through the battle, the man stayed on course and was Christ-like. In that, which is the most important of all goals, he did succeed. And that, you see, is our prime directive. Are you saved? Do you claim to be? Then be a Christian. Be Christ-like. Epaphroditus was the embodiment of what the Apostle Paul had written earlier to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. He was faithful, so faithful that he almost died because he was faithful. The man was faithful. He was faithful to Christ. He was faithful to serve God in and through and as he was dispatched by his church as well. He did what he did with a sterling testimony of faithful devotion to the Savior that wonderfully impressed the greatest Christian who ever lived, the Apostle Paul. In my book, no matter what you do, if it is not fulfilling Christ's insistence upon faithfulness, then it is not successful. I don't care what kind of numbers are produced. On the other hand, no matter how much it superficially appears to you or anyone else to have failed, if you obeyed God and and, and you were faithful to Christ, no matter how things turned out, guess what? 
you succeeded because you maintained that one requirement that the Savior has of you, and it's only one. You were faithful. Let me ask you, where other than the Christian faith is this principle true? It's certainly not business. It's not, it's not, it's, this principle doesn't apply in the business world. This principle doesn't imply in the, in, the, in, the, in the realm of professional athletics. This, this principle certainly doesn't apply in every one of the false religions of the world. As far as they're concerned, it's only performance that counts. Only performance. And so I, I think, isn't God wonderful? Is not our Savior satisfying? Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love by God's grace. Do what you can, as diligently as you can, and prayerfully leave the outcome to God. That's what Paul did. And what he wrote inspired Scripture to lead the Philippians to do as well in recognizing in Epaphroditus and taking that and applying that principle to other people's lives that's the principle that we should understand as God's people. We do the best we possibly can by God's grace, and we are content to be faithful and let God worry about the results. Amen? I know lots of churches, and I know lots of pastors, and I know lots of Christians that can't live with that, but let me tell you something. How else do you explain the comments the Apostle Paul wrote about this twice named in the New Testament man named Epaphroditus? Let's pray.